Hey everybody and welcome back to another Wheel of Time video. This is the second in my three-part series ranking my favorite Wheel of Time books. If you haven't watched the first in the series, make sure to check out the first video where I dive into my five least favorite of the novels. In this video, we're going to examine my middle five favorite books. Uh, as I mentioned in the last video, if you don't already own the audiobooks, I highly recommend taking advantage of the offer that Audible.com is giving my viewers. You can receive a free audiobook just for signing up for the free trial with Audible. You don't have to commit or pay a dime to keep your audiobook, but if you do decide to keep it, you're going to get a new book each month from their massive collection, and it only costs you 15 US dollars a month. I have the entire Wheel of Time series as a along with a bunch of other books on business development, on leadership. I love Audible. Uh, you can get access by going to www.audibletrial.com forward slash Nablus. I'll have a link in the description below. And the great part is that even by just signing up for the trial, you're really going to help out the channel. So let's just go ahead and dive right on in. Let's throw up a spoiler rating for this video. The video is going to carry a spoiler rating of red, meaning that I will be mentioning and discussing events and characters all the way through the final book. A memory of light. So if you haven't finished the series, you may want to avoid this video. I will not be going into like super deep detail with any of the plot points, but I'm definitely going to mention things that you may or may not want to hear. So watch at your own risk. And let's go ahead and quickly recap my ranking system for the books. If you want the full description on how these rankings work, go ahead and watch that in the first video, but I'll give you a quick recap right here. I have five separate factors I use in ranking the books. Each of the factors will be ranked on a scale of 1 to 10, meaning that each book will get a score out of 50. The factors are pacing, interest to the reader, character development, world building, and plot resolution slash big moments. So let's go ahead and dive into my middle five favorite Wheel of Time books, starting with number 10. So as we crack into the top 10, we're going to go back to the beginning of the series with the Eye of the World. The book that introduced us to our characters and started our journey that leads to Tarman Gaiden. With pacing, Eye of the World starts off a bit slow, and there are points in the middle of the book that seem to drag a bit, but the book really does pick up the pace as it goes. I think there's a lot of exposition and world building required in the Eye of the World, and the overall pacing of the book just feels off a bit at times. Uneven is probably the right word for it. Eye of the World's going to get a 7 out of 10 for pacing. With interest for the reader, Eye of the World also struggles a bit here. The book is extremely interesting once you get into it, but the majority of people who stop reading the books have trouble making it through the beginning of the Eye of the World. This lower level of interest can partially be attributed to the beginning of the book feeling so much like the Lord of the Rings that we feel like we kind of already know the story. It's not until they escape the two rivers that we really start to see the new story develop. Eye of the World gets a 7 out of 10 for interest as the story really picks up in its second half, but leaves some readers somewhat uninterested at the beginning. With character development, Eye of the World gets a great score here. We learn about most of our characters on the surface level, but we get extensive point of view chapters from Rand and Perrin, and we learn a lot about who they are and the inner values they possess that we'll get to see developed throughout the series. Eye of the World gets a 9 out of 10 for character development. And when it comes to world building, it's hard to do better than this. The world building is really what sucked me into the series the first time I read The Eye of the World. Robert Jordan does such a good job of introducing us to an incredibly complex and huge active world, but without the need for tons and tons of exposition. It just feels so real in a place that we could live. Eye of the World gets a 10 out of 10 for world building. And lastly, plot resolution and big moments. The end of the book certainly leaves us wanting more while at the same time resolving the plot line surrounding the Eye of the World. We learn that Rand is the Dragon Reborn, even if he isn't ready to admit it to himself. 8 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, the first book of the Wheel of Time series gets a 41 out of 50 and earns the number 10 spot on our list. Coming in at number 9 on the list, The Fires of Heaven. This book sees Rand return to Kyrian as he chases down the Shido with the rest of the Aiel. We see some of the largest battles in this book of the entire series, and we see Matt Cawthon really start to become an integral part of the story. For pacing, The Fires of Heaven is a bit more uneven than some of the other books. There are just some slow sections as they chase the Shido, Luca's traveling show with Elaine and Nynaeve, but it really picks up with the Battle of Kyrian, and it shows the scale that we're now dealing with as the Aiel come into the fold. The 
taking of Camelin and the defeat of Ravine really picks up the pace at the end as well. Fires of Heaven gets an 8 out of 10 for pacing. When it comes to interest to the reader, Fires of Heaven is pretty interesting with the rebel plot taking off, the battles with the Shido, Ravine's end, and not to mention Lanfear and Moraine. We see Avienda and Rand finally get together as well. All of these are fairly interesting plot lines in of themselves. Morghese's plot is fairly boring, however, but for interest to the reader, Fires of Heaven gets an 8 out of 10. In terms of character development, Fires of Heaven is especially strong. We see the relationship between Moraine and Rand really develop as they come to a truce, Moraine's sacrifice for Rand in tackling Lanfear, and then kind of how Rand reacts to this is really emotional and, and a big part of his character going forward. We get to see Matt turn into the battle leader and the beginnings of the Band of the Red Hand. Nynaeve conquers her fear and defeats Mogidian. All of our major characters grow in the Fires of Heaven. Fires of Heaven gets a 10 out of 10 for character development. As for world building, we aren't introduced to as many new areas or cultures as we are in the other books. The world building in the Fires of Heaven is more just driving depth into the cultures that we've already met. For instance, we learn quite a bit about the Aiel through Avienda as a proxy. We get to meet the rebel Aes Sedai and learn a lot about Aes Sedai politics. For world building, Fires of Heaven gets a score of 7 out of 10. Lastly, for plot resolution and big moments, the battle with Lanfear by the docks where Moraine sacrifices her life for Rand and Rand's attack on Camelin along with Nynaeve's capture of Mogidian and subsequent use of Mogidian to assist in killing Ravine are exciting and major moments to the book and really also for the series. Fires of Heaven gets a 9 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, Fires of Heaven gets a total of 42 out of 50 points and earns the number 9 spot on our list. <laughs> So this feels like a low spot on the list for one of my favorite books in the series, but then I think about how much I love each of the books, and you realize just how good Wheel of Time is when Lord of Chaos can be the eighth best book. The pacing in Lord of Chaos is a bit uneven, and really the only detriment to the book as a whole. It's not that it's slow, but it's just that much of the book is slow and seemingly pointless as Rand bounces around talking and avoiding different people. This slow pacing does work out well, though, as it sets up the final confrontation, which is just amazing. But more on that in a moment. For pacing, Lord of Chaos gets a 7 out of 10. With interest, I do find the book to be only moderately interesting until you reach about the halfway point, and the events from there just make it a non-stop page turner. We see our hero really defeated and helpless for the first time in the books, and you really want to know what's going to happen. The development of the Black Tower and the introduction of Mazram Taim are super interesting moments as well. As it pertains to interest for the reader, Lord of Chaos gets an 8 out of 10. For character development, this book is really, really good. We see Rand develop in all kinds of ways in this book. You see his arrogance to his creeping madness and his loss of humanity. We see Perrin accepting leadership and showing bravery and the ability to just do what needs done. We see Egwene begin to move from a puppet girl to a strong Amarlin seat. These events are the seeds of what's to come later in the series, and Robert Jordan does such a good job of subtly moving the characters forward based on what happens to them and what they have to overcome. In terms of character development, Lord of Chaos gets a 10 out of 10. With world building, we see the beginnings of the Black Tower and what that will mean for the world. We see the actual power of the Aes Sedai and the White Tower, and up to this point, we really don't see the Aes Sedai being much of a match for Rand. But here we get to see the manipulation and the challenge that they actually can pose to Rand, and it makes him feel a lot less like a powerful Mary Sue type figure, but rather a flawed but powerful hero. For world building, Lord of Chaos gets an 8 out of 10. And for the most important part of Lord of Chaos, the plot resolution and big moments. This has arguably one of the biggest moments in the novels in the Battle of Dumai's Wells that occurs at the end. Not only is it epic, but it defines the way war will be fought and redefines what power is for the world of our characters. Dumai's Wells is flat out amazing in the climax of the book where the Aes Sedai swear fealty to the Dragon Reborn. And the utter destruction that the Ashermen create gives you goosebumps. Lord of Chaos gets an easy 10 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. Overall, Lord of Chaos gets a 43 out of 50 and earns the number 8 spot on my list. So Knife of Dreams is the book where the Wheel of Time really transitions to the last battle and the pace of the series really starts to pick up. It's the end of the slog and the plot points begin to get resolved at a much faster rate from this point going forward. So for pacing, Knife of Dreams really does pick up the pace here. It's the last book that Robert Jordan finished himself, and the pacing of the book is still slower in the traditional Robert Jordan fashion, 
but it steadily picks up and the events start happening at a fairly quick pace throughout. Knife of Dreams gets a 9 out of 10 for pacing. As it goes with interest for the reader, Knife of Dreams has resolution to several long-running plot lines and we really get to see Matt and Perrin shine. Rand also gets to confront another Forsaken. For interest to the reader, Knife of Dreams gets a 9 out of 10. For character development, we see some solid development here and really more depth into some of our side characters. Matt demonstrates the leader that he is and proves himself to Tuon, and Perrin finally ends his struggle dealing with Fael's capture. Lan gets featured as well in his quest that takes him all the way across the borderlands. Knife of Dreams gets an 8 out of 10 for character development. When it comes to world building, we do get to see more of a couple different cultures and locations. We see the Ogier and the Borderlands, and we learn more about the Children of Light, as well as diving deeper into the politics of the White Tower and the Rebels. While there is not a ton of new world building material, the depth and detail that we are still learning at this point just goes to show what an immersive and robust world Robert Jordan created. For world building, Knife of Dreams gets an 8 out of 10. With plot resolution and big moments, there's quite a bit of resolution that occurs within the book. We finally get resolution to the Shido storyline and Fael's capture, as well as the Tuon escaping Ebudar storyline. The Eludra plot with the dragons that has been building since the second book of the series finally comes to fruition as well. This is the beginning of the end of the story, and the crazy amount of, re of resolution that starts to happen from here on is really fun. For plot resolution and big moments, Knife of Dreams gets a 10 out of 10. In total, Knife of Dreams gets a 44 out of 50 and earns the number 7 spot on my list. So we had a tie for the number five spot on the list, so I'm going to break the tie and just go with the one that my gut says I liked better for the number five spot. So that leaves us with The Dragon Reborn taking the sixth spot. The Dragon Reborn is the third book in the series and is an amazing follow-up to The Great Hunt, picking up just a few months after the end of that book. For pacing, The Dragon Reborn, just like The Great Hunt before it, has really great pacing. It really builds to the end quite nicely, and the interweaving of the storylines as they all come to a head at the end of the book is very satisfying. For pacing, The Dragon Reborn gets a 10 out of 10. With interest, there is very little of Rand in the book. And while Perrin, Moraine, and Lan all follow him, they do not quite carry the interest for the reader that Rand does. Matt does start to become an interesting character as he wakes up after being healed from the Shadar Logoth dagger. So for interest to the reader, the Dragon Reborn gets an 8 out of 10. In the character development category, we finally get to see Matt Cawthon have a real character rather than just being this possessed guy. We see Perrin develop as well, and he also develops a love interest. Love that or hate that. The little we see of Rand also reflects the deep inner conflict that he has about being told that he's the savior of the world and trying to decide if that's real or if he's just an Aes Sedai puppet. We see Nynaeve, Elaine, and Egwene off on their own again, having their own adventures as they hunt the Black Aja, and having to learn and develop as individual characters as well. For character development, The Dragon Reborn gets a 9 out of 10. World building wise, we get to see Ilian and Tyr for the first time in the novels, albeit very briefly. As always, the further development of the world is an amazing strength of Robert Jordan's writing. While it's not quite as good as The Great Hunt is in terms of introducing us to new parts of the world, it's still really good. The Dragon Reborn gets an 8 out of 10 for world building. So The Dragon Reborn has some pretty amazing big moments and one of my personal favorite moments of the entire series occurs early in the book, not even at the climax of the story. Matt's fight with Galad and Gawain is very, very satisfying considering I can't stand Gawain. The defeat of Two Forsaken at the end of the novel after a carefully laid trap by Bilal and the resolution of having all the different plot threads tie together was also super satisfying. The Dragon Reborn gets a 10 out of 10 for plot resolution and big moments. In total, The Dragon Reborn scores a total of 45 out of 50 and gets the number 6 spot on my list. So we're going to go ahead and end this video right here. What did you think of my middle 5? What do you think of my list so far? I'll have my top 5 out tomorrow and that will complete the series, so make sure to look out for that. If you are liking my content, please like the video below and subscribe to the channel and check out my Patreon page if you want to have input into the content I make. You can see clips of my notes, you can see little video notes from me as I'm making my videos. I try to stay in touch there and you'll also have access to my Discord server. I want to thank all of my patrons as I really, really appreciate your support and it does help the channel grow. I'm really trying to get some new lighting to, to pump up the videos, so I really am super grateful for anybody that does want to support what I'm doing. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video and I will see all of you next time. Tinker in the kitchen with a job of work to do 
The mistress up above, slipping on the rope of blue. She prances down the staircase, a fancy oh so free. Crying, Tinker, oh dear Tinker, won't you mend a pot for me? 